I'm delighted that Carol Baldwin is here this evening to uh, present even further stories from the Galapagos and to share stories that are not in the film. In addition to what you saw here, she was a science advisor on this film as well as an on-air talent. And a little bit more about Dr. Baldwin. She grew up in, South, in coastal South Carolina and studied at James Madison Uni University, the College of Charleston, and the College of William and Mary. She's published over four dozen scientific articles. Her work includes the discovery of new species, as you saw in the film, not only in the Galapagos, but also in Belize, Tobago, Cook Islands, Australia, and El Salvador. She's on the editorial board for the scientific journal Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington and on the advisory board for the Caribbean Coral Reef Ecosystem Program. Dr. Baldwin is a lead scientist in the development of new permanent ocean exhibits at the Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History. Carol and her work have been featured in numerous articles in magazines and newspapers and on CNN and on the ABC television special Planet Earth 2000. In 2003, she was inducted into the Women's Divers Hall of Fame. She's devoted much time to sharing her experiences as a marine biologist with school students, with the general public, and is a positive mo role model for young girls considering careers in science. Are there any young girls here tonight considering careers in science? A few? I'm glad. <laughs> and as I mentioned earlier, she's the senior author of One Fish, Two Fish, Crawfish, Blue Fish, the Smithsonian's Sustainable Seafood Cookbook, and she'll be signing copies later. And when she's not in the field doing research or out doing public presentations like this, she works in the Division of Fishes at the Smithsonian's, the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of Natural History, where she's been working since 1982, 1992. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carol Baldwin. Thanks, John. Thank you all for coming. Um, what I thought I'd do is just uh, tell you a few stories about making this film uh, in Galapagos and then tell you a bit more about the most adventurous aspect of the filming for me, which of course was getting into that submersible and descending 3,000 feet into the ocean. And then um, at the end I will um, just tell you uh, briefly uh, how a Smithsonian scientist came to write a cookbook. <laughs> Um, we, we ended up spending about 12 weeks uh, all together, I'm sorry, about 14 weeks all together in the Galapagos Islands while we were making the film. Um, we had not planned on spending that much time. However, we encountered some problems right off the bat. Our first trip was in the summer of 1998, and some of you may remember that El Nino was causing problems uh, throughout the world, and uh, uh, Galapagos was no uh, exception. Um, the reason that uh, El Nino can be a problem is in Galapagos um, is the following. Um, here are the islands. They're located about 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador, and they're on the equator. So the air temperatures are very warm and tropical, as you'd expect. But the water around the islands is very cold, and that's in part because of this Humboldt current that comes up from the south and because of the upwelling of very uh, deep, cold water. And this cold water that comes up from the deep is just loaded with nutrients, and they form the, um, the basis of the food chain that supports an incredible amount of life there. So a very typical coastal scene in Galapagos is just uh, having the rocks just covered with algae. And then as you saw in the movie, uh, these enormous uh, fish schools underwater. So it's a very productive ecosystem. And what happens during El Nino is that that upwelling of that cold, nutrient-rich water is suppressed, and you get this mass of very warm, nutrient-poor water moving into the area, and it just disrupts the whole system. Um, so for example, this is... Um, Let's see if I can get the next one here. Uh, this is a typical scene in the summer of 1998 during El Nino where there was no algae at all. Um, the marine iguanas didn't even bother going into the water because there was so little, uh, so little algae there for them to feed on. And uh, during the summer of 98, we saw dead or dying sea lions, seabirds, marine iguanas. Basically, everything associated with the uh, marine environment was um, negatively impacted. 
On land, on the other hand, El Nino is accompanied by a lot of rain, so the plant populations do very well. And then because of the increased plant populations, you get expanded bird populations. Um, so anyway, we filmed uh, what we could and uh, went home and regrouped and went back about six months later in February of 1999 and everything had completely turned around. The upwelling of that cold, nutrient-rich water had resumed. There was algae everywhere. The marine iguanas were fat and happy. The marine environment was thriving. Um, on land, on the other hand, it was now the driest period on record. So the expanded bird and, uh, and uh, plant populations were suffering. So very much a seesaw, and actually as a biologist, it was quite interesting to see um, these two extremes in such a short uh, period of time. Well, another challenge involved with making a 3D IMAX film like this is that it requires a lot of equipment. In fact, we completely filled the cargo hold of a military C-130 um, to get to Galapagos. And in a remote location like the Galapagos, whoops, that went the wrong way. In a remote location like the Galapagos, all of this equipment has to be hand-carried up and down volcanoes and across lava terrain. The 3D technology works best if the camera is moving, so minimally they would um, construct a dolly track to move the camera along, um, but usually a uh, crane was uh, constructed. Now, this whole system is um, over 1,000 pounds. It does break up into parts, but the camera itself is about 250 pounds, but this, uh, this piece of equipment here is called a hothead device, it allows somebody standing on the ground here to, co to remotely control the camera, and that hothead device is about 500 pounds, and it took about four men to, uh, to carry that piece of equipment alone. Um, the size of the system uh, caused some problems in terms of being able to film everything we wanted to. This is the Galapagos penguin, and you did not see this in the IMAX film. This was a big disappointment to me because I think the, the fact that penguins occur there tell a big part of the ecological story. These islands are on the equator, so what in the heck are penguins doing there? Well, um, in fact, this is the only penguin species that occurs even remotely close to the equator, and um, it's uh, uh, just indicative of how how cold the waters are around the Galapagos. Now, we actually did film penguins, and we did this by putting the uh, IMAX camera on this inflatable Zodiac, and then we cruised past some rocks where these penguins were sitting. And the footage looked really good on video, but when they put it on the big IMAX screen, there was just enough rocking in that Zodiac that they were afraid you would all get seasick. So <laughs> penguins hit the cutting room floor because of that. All right, now this is what the camera looks like once you put it in its protective underwater housing. Now it's about the size of a refrigerator and about 2,000 pounds. Imagine going into the water with a 2,000 pound camera system. Um, just getting it into the water was um, uh, difficult. This is about a 70-foot tourist boat that we used in Galapagos for the underwater operations, and this is a davit that we built on the stern of the ship to deploy and retrieve the camera. That thing had to be um, reinforced about 10 times to make it strong enough to hold that camera. But, um, but putting the camera in the water was very tricky. If you can imagine, as soon as that weight comes off, that 2,000-pound weight comes up off the stern of the ship, if there's any rocking at all in the ship, that, that camera's going to start swinging. So there were a lot of days that we just sat on the ship and couldn't film just because we couldn't get the camera into the water. Um, here's a shot of the underwater camera um, in the water, and these four uh, blue dive propulsion vehicles um, actually allowed the underwater cinematographer, Al, Al Giddings, very good control of that camera underwater, um, particularly in the face of very strong currents um, in, the, uh, in the Galapagos. Now, there was one uh, disappointment for me in terms of underwater footage, and that is that we did not get the marine iguanas feeding underwater in the IMAX film. Um, the, uh, these iguanas are feeding in fairly shallow, rocky, surgy areas, and although we tried several times, there was just no way to get this 2,000-pound camera system into this area um, to feed the marine iguanas, I mean, to film the marine iguanas feeding. Um, I do have some video footage um, of the marine iguanas feeding underwater that I'll show you in a minute, and I think you'll, um, you'll enjoy that. Okay, the last um, challenge that I'll mention um, in terms of making the film uh, actually involves the film itself. The 3D IMAX camera only holds about three minutes of film at one time. And once that's been shot, it takes about an hour to reload the camera. And every three minutes of film that goes through the camera costs $4,000. 
So I learned very quickly that they don't just turn the camera on and let it run, hoping that the animals will do what they want them to do. And a good example of that is the when we were filming the frigate birds. Do you remember in the film we had a male and a female frigate bird sitting side by side, and the male had that red throat patch, beautifully inflated. They do this in attempts to attract a female mate. Well, when we were filming them, just when we got ready to roll the camera, that male deflated that throat pouch. And we sat there and we sat there for an hour or more just waiting for this, this bird to reinflate its pouch, and nothing was happening. Finally, um, one of the naturalist guides who was with us noticed that one of the IMAX cameramen was wearing a red baseball cap, and he had an idea. He pulled the cap off of the guy and started waving it in the air in front of this frigate bird who mistook it for competition from another male, immediately inflated its pouch, and we rolled the camera and got the shot. So there are a lot of little tricks in uh, wildlife photography. Okay, well certainly one of the thrilling aspects of visiting the Galapagos is knowing that so many of the animals that you're seeing don't occur anywhere else in the world. This is the only place that you can go to see them. Um, but the thrill is even greater because in Galapagos the animals allow you to get very, very close. You can get close to the giant tortoises, to the marine iguanas, you can get close to the land iguanas, and sometimes you don't have a whole lot of say in the matter. The animals will just come land right on you. Uh, these animals in Galapagos have existed for thousands of years in the absence of any naturally occurring large mammals. Large mammals are just one type of animal that never made it across 600 miles of ocean to the Galapagos. And large mammals are typically top predators in most ecosystems, so the Galapagos animals have just never developed any fear of large animals, and that extends to humans. And I would just say that in addition to being a very charming aspect of visiting the Galapagos Islands, this tameness of the animals really really helped make our 3D uh, filming venture a successful one. Um, in the um, Galapagos, we could take that very large, very loud camera and just swing it down and, and drop it right beside an animal, and it would just sit there. And uh, I don't think there are very many places in the world where you could do this. This tameness of the animals extends uh, also to the underwater world, which surprised me. And so large pelagic fishes like jacks will come so close to you underwater that you can just reach out and touch them. They'll just completely envelop you. Um, and this is not an experience I've had any other place in the world where I've been diving. Um, of course, having underwater animals come close is only good depending on what's coming close. Uh, jacks aren't known to bother divers, but of course, hammerhead sharks can. And in the northernmost islands of Darwin and Wolf, every time we got into the water, we were in the presence of hammerhead sharks, sometimes 100 or more, some of them probably 400, 500 pounds. Um, I had never been in the water with a lot of sharks, and I was very intimidated by this at first. However, right off the bat, I noticed that these sharks were swimming with a lot of other fish, and they did not appear to be feeding. So um, that made me feel better right off the bat that these uh, sharks weren't up in the shallow waters we were diving um, to feed. Um, when they came close, I actually noticed um, these small angelfish called king angelfish that appeared to be picking uh, things off of the hammerheads. And this is apparently a cleaning association that has evolved in the Galapagos where these, um, these king angelfish are serving as cleaners of parasites on the hammerhead sharks. Um, this is a good thing for the hammerhead. Um, they don't want to frighten the cleaner away, and animals that are being cleaned tend to be very docile, um, very non-aggressive. So it certainly deserves more study, but first of all, I think that's why the hammerheads are up in the shallow waters to be clean, and secondly, that's why they um, might be so uh, unaggressive. Those dang moray eels. Um, I can say that I did get comfortable with the hammerhead sharks, but I never got comfortable with these uh, spotted moray eels. These are three to four feet long, and as you see in the film, um, uh, pretty wide. They're not poisonous, um, but they look very much like, um, like uh, underwater snakes. Um, Moray eels are supposed to be secretive. If they were in this room, they'd be hiding under, you know, a chair and just darting out occasionally to grab something to eat. But in Galapagos, these animals are just swimming around in the open. So something I'd like to go back and, and do is, is study the behavior of these animals some. Um, I mainly put this slide in here just to um, remind you that if you're interested in hearing a couple of moray stories, just uh, ask me when we get to the, to the Q&A part. 
Okay, well, I certainly had a lot of adv adventurous experiences while we were making the film, but of course, this was the uh, the highlight, going down 3,000 feet in this um, Johnson Sea Link uh, submersible. And in fact, having a chance to get in the sub was the main reason I agreed to get involved with the film project. Um, I had been studying deep sea fish at the Smithsonian for many years, but only from preserved museum material, which is great, but I'd never had the chance to see any of these animals that I was working with alive and in their natural habitat. Um, this, for example, is a tripod fish. Um, it gets its name from the three elongate fin rays that it uses to perch up off the bottom. Um, this fish can live down as deep as 15,000 feet. Okay, um, a little more about the sub. Um, this is the uh, the Johnson Sea Link, and you only see in the film um, two people in the sub, but there's actually a rear chamber for another sub staff person and another observer. Um, the front's definitely a place to be. That acrylic sphere to look out of is just uh, it just gives you a fantastic view. Um, the sub, of course, is uh, equipped with a lot of gear that we can use. Um, you saw the uh, the lasers from the video camera. I'm going to show you some video from that in just a minute. There's also a still camera. In terms of collecting organisms, there's a, a funnel-shaped suction device up here called the Upper Critter Getter, and uh, we can use that to suck in jellyfish and, and small squid and things like that. Um, by far, the most important piece of collecting gear and one that you saw in action in the film is that robotic arm um, at the end of which is a uh, suction tube and um, a variety of other uh, pieces of collecting equipment. If you're going to ride in, that, in the rear chamber of the sub, there's a hatch door underneath. If you're going to ride in the front, you climb that ladder and enter through a hatch uh, door on the top. The um, hatch door is then closed and locked by somebody from the outside, and then, as you saw in the film, the, the sub is then hoisted up and off, off the back uh, or the stern of the ship. Um, the main difference between a submersible and a submarine is that a submersible is only autonomous. It's only on its own um, once it's in the water. Um, it has to be, a submersible has to be carried on and deployed and retrieved by a mothership. And in our case, we had the 200-foot research vessel, uh, Seward Johnson, from Fort Pierce, Florida. So here's the sub, and here's the big hoist for uh, deploying and retrieving it. Um, as soon as the sub uh, uh, enters the water, the sub staff person in the rear chamber of the sub takes a flashlight and just checks that lower hatch door for leaks. And once he's uh, sure there's no water coming in, he communicates to the pilot, we have a seal. The pilot then radios the, mother, uh, the captain of the mothership and requests permission to dive. And once that um, is received, diving simply involves pulling two levers, which flood the ballast tanks with water, and using gravity, down you go. And it takes about 30 minutes to get down to 3,000 feet. And on the way down, you can see all kinds of really stunning um, pelagic organisms, such as, uh, such as this one, which I'll, I'll tell you about in the video. But most of the time, we would, take, we would make the, the descents and the ascents um, with all of the lights in the sub and outside the sub turned off. And that's so we could enjoy the bioluminescence that's in the ocean. I had expected to see a little bit, but I was absolutely blown away by how much bioluminescence that we saw. And if you can just picture in your mind a very dark uh, summer night and it's raining a billion fireflies, it was something like that. It was just extraordinary. Um, when you get to the bottom, you have about um, three hours to work, and work um, involves cruising around the bottom, um, photographing um, and collecting and taking uh, notes. Of course, um, we're looking for specimens or species that are of interest to our own research projects, and, of course, we're interested in uh, discovering new species. So I'm going to take you to the video now and uh, show you some actual footage that was uh, taken with that um, uh, video camera mounted on the outside of the, uh, of the sub. Okay, this is a, a, a new species of wrasse that we uh, collected in the islands. Um, actually, it's a very brightly colored fish um, that doesn't uh, look very colorful uh, down deep there, but as soon as you, there you just saw it dive into the sand. Um, if you brought that fish up to the surface, you would actually see that it's, uh, it's quite colorful. Um, here we're on the bottom at, uh, just notice that up here is the depth. Don't pay any attention to the data over here. Um, Every time we landed on the bottom, it was different. And I don't know if you can see these white um, things that are coming out of the bottom here. These are all, are all eels. And as the sub um, approaches these eels, they uh, pop back down into their, um, into their holes. 
Okay, we're at about almost 3,000 feet here, and um, this is a type of sea anemone. It turned out to be a new species. Uh, we gave it the common name, the Venus flytrap anemone, just from the, the way it looked. This was um, it's being described by scientists at the California Academy of, of Sciences in San Francisco. Okay, watch this uh, little snail here. Now, normally you just think about snail uh, shells and re don't really think about the animal that uh, lives within them. But the uh, pilot's going to come over and tap this um, uh, shell with that robotic arm and uh, watch what happens here. That's called a swimming gaza, G-A-Z-A, -A, and it's apparently a very highly prized uh, shell by um, shell collectors. Okay, um, here we have a very long eel-like deep sea fish that's coming into the picture. This fish is probably oh, four feet in length or so. And he's just going to slither across here. A lot of um, the fish that live in the deep are these, um, these benthic, these bottom-associated uh, fish such as this one. There's a, a shark back there. He's going to disappear. I'll show you a better uh, shark in a, in a few minutes. Okay, the fish that's coming into the picture there is the orange ruffy, and you may be familiar with that um, from uh, seafood counters. Um, interestingly, these orange ruffy fish can live to about 150 years, and they don't reach sexual maturity until they're about 30 or 40. So they have really been overfished because of that, uh, um, that lifestyle that they have. Um, we're looking here at uh, not a very exciting fish. It's called a rat tail, also called a grenadier. Um, but it's a fish that's very, very abundant in the deep ocean. We've known about these fish for a long time from trawls, including um, from uh, fishing uh, vessels that often catch these and, and sell them as a uh, food fish. Here's another uh, example of a, a deep sea fish. They, they tend to be very slow moving. It's quite cold down there at 3,000 feet. Uh, we were measuring just above freezing. Um, and uh, even though some of them have eyes, we're not really sure how much they're using them because, of course, um, note light is penetrating down there past about uh, 600 feet or so. Here's a snipe eel coming into the picture. It's swimming with its head down, and it's reacting to the presence of the sub. That's some type of marine worm. We did not collect it. We just photographed it, and uh, that's about as good as we can do without a specimen. There's a new species of feather star. We thought these were um, sponges, and we didn't bother collecting them at first, and then we finally picked up one. It turned out not only to be a new species of sea cucumber, but an entire new family. Um, these are uh, sponges. Uh, they're called glass sponges, and this one actually has a white starfish wrapped around the uh, the base of the um, of the sponge. This starfish probably isn't eating the sponge itself, but probably eating little um, organisms that are living uh, on the sponge. Okay, there's a couple of those sponges without crabs on them. I'm sorry, sorry without starfish. Um, this is a uh, this big guy here is a king crab that you may be familiar with in the seafood market. This thing's about four feet uh, tip to tip, very large. And this is just a great shot of all those. You can see all the little mouth parts working there. Now this crab has one of those glass sponges in its claws, and again, probably not eating the sponge. There's not a whole lot there, but probably eating organisms growing on it. Um, this is a new species of sun star, and uh, here comes a little hermit crab into the picture. It's going to bump into that and uh, go the other way. <laughs> Okay, now this was probably my favorite organism down in the deep. This is called a chimera or a ratfish. Um, we know almost nothing about these fish except that they're the, the poorly known cousins of the sharks and stingrays. Like sharks and stingrays, they have a cartilaginous skeleton rather than a bony one. This animal is probably about seven feet. They get up to eight or nine feet in length. We discovered three species of coelacanth, I'm sorry, of, um, rat, of, uh, uh, ratfish in the um, Galapagos. All three of them were new species, and this one was recognizable by this white pigment on the dorsal fin. But look what this animal has done. He's now turned around and is swimming towards us. We have stopped the sub, and we're backing up. And uh, so he's just chasing us down here. This is just the best shot I've ever seen of these uh, these ratfish. 
Um, most animals either would stop when they got uh, the, the lights of the sub hit them, or they would dart away, like you saw that shark did. But this animal was just uh, just uh, was very sub friendly. Um, this is a type of jellyfish known as a siphonophore. It's um, about four or five feet in length. Um, and siphonophores are, co are colonial jellyfish. They're made up of individual units, e each of which has its own function in the colony. Um, these are very poisonous animals, um, even though we, we tried collecting one initially because we thought this would be really great to, to uh, shoot in 3D and in the, in the aquarium. But um, it broke up into pieces as soon as we, uh, as soon as we pulled it in. Okay, now there's an, uh, that's a small octopus. One of the scientists who was with us studies uh, squid and octopus, so whenever possible we were trying to collect these. But if you have ever studied anything about octopus, you'll remember that they have um, eight arms with suckers. Um, so what you're going to see here is the, uh, the pilot's going to bring the robotic arm into the, the picture here with the suction tube and uh, try to collect this octopus. There you can see the shadow of the arm coming in. There you can see the tube up here. And what happens here is that this octopus wraps his arms around the suction tube, but it turns out his suction is stronger than our suction, and uh, we weren't actually able to collect this specimen. We had to turn our suction off and tap the arm and let the octopus swim away. So we got him on film, but uh, we didn't get the specimen. Okay, this doesn't come into great focus. Remember, this camera's on the outside of the sub, but this is, um, this is the goose fish that you saw us try to collect, and his mouth went wide open, and uh, we weren't able to collect him in the suction tube that way, but we were actually able to pick him up, bring him over to the sub, turn the suction off, and drop, uh, turn the suction off and drop him into a bucket. And so here's the same animal now up on our shipboard aquarium. And it's just a great shot here of these barbels that allows them to, to sense the presence of um, prey on the bottom and then those wonderful teeth that are just a, a part of a lot of the deep sea fish. Um, this is one of several new species of scorpion fishes that we uh, found on these dives. Um, this one was recognizable by these two long dorsal fins. Uh, elements. You know, once we'd collect a couple of something that we thought was uh, might be new, we, we would just go on to something else and uh um, and try to collect as great a diversity as possible. Okay, this is just another example of landing on the bottom and, uh, and just, you know, just a completely different um, topography. These are pencil urchins related to um, starfish and, uh, and sea urchins. Um, this is not a new species, but it was previously known from a single specimen and thought to be extremely rare. Well, obviously not very rare at all, just nobody had been looking in the right place. Um, so these are so those are all pencil, pencil, uh, pencil urchins. There are going to be some um, some other echinoderms coming up here. There, I actually just saw some there. Here's some more. These are brittle stars um, related to starfish as well. Okay, this is um, a, another type of crab called a cancer crab. In fact, if you're familiar with Dungeness crab on the west coast, um, that's uh, basically what this animal is. But um, we, crabs were, <laughs> were really easy to um, photograph with that video relative to um, fish because they just this one just does a nice little pirouette and they don't swim away. Okay, this is a hermit crab that apparently couldn't find a shell, and he grabbed a sponge instead. You can see his little legs trying to hold that sponge on. So I guess down the deep, you just take whatever's available. Um, this is a new species of cat shark uh, that we collected, and it's about maybe two and a half feet or so long. We're in the process of describing that one right now. This is a type of jellyfish. You're going to see this better in a second, so I won't explain it um, very well here, but it's, uh, it's one of the jellyfish known as uh, comb jellies. Okay, we're at almost 2,000 feet here, and look at this. It looks like a shallow reef. There's starfish, there's sponges, there's stylaster coral. Um, a lot of the new species that we found came from these deep reef areas, and this is an area I'm really interested in studying more in the future. Um, you, can't, you can't study it any other way. You've got to go there. You can't drag a net across that. It's too, it's too rocky, and you can't, of course, scuba dive to it because it's way beyond uh, um, the depths that we can scuba dive to. Um, this is an adult uh, uh, jello nose. 
remember that fish that I was holding at the end and we were pulling things out of the bucket um, that was very slimy? That was the adult. And here's the juvenile. It looks very much like it in the way it, it acts and in, and its shape, but it's completely different color pattern. The juvenile is uh, polka dotted. You see that a lot in fish where the young stages um, look very different from the adults. Okay, that's about a five-foot squid, and normally we wouldn't have even bothered trying to collect something that big with the limitations we had with the submersible, but this animal was, was moving very slowly. So just like with that goosefish, we were able to take the suction tube, actually pick that squid up, bring it to the sub, turn the suction off, and drop it into a big bucket and collect it that way. Okay, this is uh, actually a sea cucumber. Sea cucumbers are normally slug-like animals that look like this end of it, and they're usually just you know crawling across the bottom. Very um, common inhabitants of the of the deep ocean bottom. Um, but this one has this skirt or bell, and this is actually a swimming sea cucumber. And you'll see it swimming in just a minute in an in an aquarium shot. But here you can see these little feet coming out from underneath, and apparently this animal is down on the bottom uh, to feed. So it looks very much like a jellyfish, but it's actually uh, it actually is a sea cucumber. Okay, um, you have a rock here with a lot of life on it sand bottom around it and basically no life on it and that's very common in the deep so anytime there's a physical structure for life to inhabit it's it's pretty much covered and here you've got this uh, stylaster coral and these uh, these cra uh, these crabs one two three four five six seven appendages on that animal nothing in life is that asymmetrical um, when I first showed this video at the Smithsonian one of the scientists suggested that that is a larval octopod of some kind that has probably that has lost one of its appendages, but it can regenerate that. There's another one of those siphonophores, uh, again, four or five feet in length. This one is different from the other one because of the um, all these bristles that are coming off of it. Um, after our experience with the first one, we didn't try to collect these uh, these animals any anymore. But again, very common, the jellyfish and uh, these big uh, siphonophore-like jellyfish, very common in the deep. Okay, that's a stingray. And remember I said earlier that that chimera, that ratfish, was um, uh, closely related to sharks and stingrays. And I think you can see, remember how graceful that animal was swimming as it came towards the sub? I think you can see the relationship there between um, the, uh, the ratfish and the uh, stingray. There's a beautiful medusa form of a jellyfish. And here's a great shot of one of those comb jellyfish jellies, or tenophorus are also called. Um, these animals have rows of cilia that are constantly beating, and um, they're just beautiful in the uh, underwater because they're, they're, they're iridescent. Okay, here's that um, pelagic or swimming sea cucumber actually swimming, and you can see how it's using that bell to uh, propel itself through the water. We were going down once um, in, uh, in the sub with all the lights turned off, and, and all of a sudden something glowing about the size of the frisbee hit the front windshield of that uh, submersible. We immediately turned the lights on and it turned out to be one of these animals. Um, nobody ever knew that sea cucumbers could uh, be bioluminescent before. So we collected this animal, brought it to the surface, put it in our aquarium in, our, in a dark room and tried to get it to, to uh, uh, bioluminesce for us, but um, we didn't have any luck. Okay, this is um, a, a ugly fish called the tube eyes. It gets that name from the way the f eyes are sort of projected anteriorly. And uh, this, um, e this fish has uh, a feature common in a lot of deep sea fish, and that's a mouthful of, um, of big teeth. Presumably the meals are few and far between down there, so something comes by, you don't want to let it get away. Here's an even better example of that. This is a living form of the one that I was looking at at the microscope at the end of the film. This is called a vitamin. Fish. And you can see that these teeth don't even fit in the mouth. They go up along the outside, seemingly dangerously close to the eyes. Um, but again, um, you know, meals are few and far between. With a mouth full of teeth like that, you're likely not going to let something get away. Okay, we are out of the sub now, back up in the surface waters with video uh, cameras swimming around. There's one of the hammerheads. See the eyes are way out at the ends of the head there. As we mentioned in the film, these sharks have um, sensors on the underside of the head that pick up electromagnetic signals. Signals, and all living things emit at least weak electric, uh, weak electric signals, so that's how they're locating something to eat. They're just detecting the presence of the prey um, with, those, uh, with those sensors. Um, 
Okay, uh, but again, you can see all these fish that they're swimming around with, and you don't see any of these sharks um, attacking any of those fish. So presumably, these animals um, have uh, the, the, the big head, you know, evolved because the more sensor, the bigger head you have, the more space you have for these sensors um, for um, detecting prey. Those were, um, uh, that's a big school of barracuda. I don't know if you remember in the, in the film that, that big school of fish I was surrounded by. Those were actually barracuda. They were small, juveniles, probably only a foot and a half or two feet in length. Okay, there he is. There's a marine iguana feeding on the algae underwater. So you can see they grab onto the rocks. They have very serrate teeth and they scrape the algae off the rocks. Now, relative to other iguanas, the tail is somewhat compressed, um, so the laterally compressed, so um, it really helps them in, in swimming. But I can say that I've been in a lot of places, you know, diving, and there's just something very weird about coming face to face with a big lizard underwater. They just don't look like they belong there. Okay, we'll just end here with a little bit of footage of the uh, playful sea lions. If you visit the Galapagos Islands, and about 60,000 tourists a year do visit, um, make sure you plan on snorkeling. Take a, a, a wetsuit or at least something to keep you um, warm because the water's chilly. But I guarantee you, you will get to swim with uh, the young sea lions. And um, if you don't pay any attention to them, they'll sometimes come and try to, you know, nip at your fins or whatever to try to get you to play with them. They're really cute. They're um, we. We started calling them the Cocker Spaniel puppies of the underwater world because they are very playful. Okay, if we could cut that video, that's just the IMAX camera underwater, and go back to the slides. Let me just uh, make a couple of uh, comments here. Um, we ended up using that submersible in Galapagos on 15 days, and so far we've discovered over 15 new species from those dives. So that means that every single day we took the sub into the deep, we discovered a species of life that was um, previously unknown. And it's just indicative of how little we know about the oceans. Um, as you probably know, Earth is covered, um, uh, about 70% of the Earth is covered with oceans, but this isn't just a little thin film of, of, of water on the surface. The average depth of the ocean is about um, uh, 12,000 feet, and the deepest point is down greater than 36,000 feet. So in fact, oceans account for 97% of the living space on this planet, 97%. And we've, dis we've explored less than 5% of this space. So why has there been so little exploration of this largest domain of our planet? Um, in part, it's because the technology to do so is relatively relatively new. Even scuba gear has only been around for about 50 years. And submersible technology, although it's been available in the military for some time, um, has really only become available uh, to scientists in the past 10 years or so. Also, relative to putting on scuba gear and jumping in the water with a dip net, the submersible is a little expensive. Um, the ship and sub that we used in Galapagos cost about $14,000 a day, which sounds like a lot of money, but just to make a point, um, I made a few calculations. Um, as I mentioned, we used the sub on 15 days in Galapagos. If we had another 20 days for the ship to come and go from Florida and for inclement weather days when we can't uh, uh, get the sub into the um, water, let's say a total of 35 days and at $14,000 per day, $490,000. So roughly half a million dollars for, was the cost of discovering 15. We're actually up to about uh, 19 uh, new species now. Again, it sounds like a lot, but just to to put this in perspective, about the same time that we were doing the submersible dives in Galapagos, NASA lost the Mars Orbiter. And the Mars Orbiter cost $125 million. And with $125 million, we could make 250 35 day submersible expeditions and potentially discover 3,750 new species. <laughs> this is not a criticism of our space program. I'm actually a big fan, but still, as a marine biologist, I can't help but wonder why we spend so much time, energy, and money exploring space and so little exploring our own planet. Um, I think there is good news um, as far as this goes. Uh, there is a new federal government program called Ocean Exploration that is um, through the NOAA offices, and it's putting in a small amount of money anyway each year um, to into ocean exploration. Um, and there's also talk of a big bill in the House called BOB, the Big Oceans Bill. And if that gets passed, that's going to put tens of millions of dollars each year into ocean exploration. But for all of the kids in the audience, if you 
you are interested in studying the ocean, you are really growing up in an exciting time because we finally have the technology to visit the depths of the ocean. And in the next 10, 20, 30 years really have the potential to be uh, the age of exploration of our oceans. Okay, um, before I take questions, I'm just going to um, tell you briefly about the um, uh, latest um, uh my latest project, because we'll be doing the book signing for this um, um, right after this. And, and in part, uh, the evolution of this project had to do with the Galapagos. And as, as John mentioned, um, my, my latest project is the publication of a cookbook um, on sustainable seafood. And um, over the, the past 10 years or so, my research as a marine biologist at the Smithsonian has taken me to places around the world, such as Galapagos, where I started seeing firsthand some of the impacts that humans were having on ocean resources. For example, I visited Tokyo, Japan, and went to the Skiji fish market there. I don't know if any of you have visited that, but this is um, a market that comprises city block after city block after city block of fresh seafood, and it's there every day. I don't think you can visit this place and, and not walk away wondering how there can be anything left in the ocean. Um, in the Galapagos Islands, the water surrounding the islands are supposed to be protected as a marine reserve. And yet every time I've been there, and I've been going every year since we finished making the film, leading study tours, um, I've seen examples of illegal fishing activity. I'm not just talking about small local Ecuadorian fishermen, many of whom have permission to fish in certain areas, but I'm talking about huge foreign industrial-sized fishing ships that are in the area illegally. And finally, in 2001, I was part of a Smithsonian research expedition to El Salvador where we were um, surveying the fish that live along the coast there. I had the chance to work one day aboard an El Salvadorian shrimp trawler. Every four hours, the um, two trawl nets are brought in and the context contents are dumped on the deck of the ship and then the, the shrimp are sorted out and I'm not exaggerating when I say that less than 10% of the catch is shrimp. Um, the rest of it after the shrimp is sorted out is shoveled overboard several hours later, almost all of it dead. Um, this is called bycatch and it's an enormous problem worldwide with some 60 billion pounds or so of sea life discarded each year um, as bycatch. I guess for a long time I just thought, you know, these are problems that other countries have. Surely a country, a well-off country like the United States is in better shape. So really just out of curiosity, I started investigating this, and I was really shocked to learn that in case after case after case, we have been really poor stewards of many of our own, our own ocean resources. Um, Atlantic cod, bluefin tuna, king crab, uh, bay scallops, it just goes on and on. Atlantic halibut is now commercially extinct. By that I mean that the population is so low it can no, no longer support any uh, commercial fishery. So then I started wondering, well, are there good stories as well? And uh, um, I mean, I know we've got problematic species, but but what are the? I didn't want to quit eating seafood, so you know, what were the good choices? So um, Julie Mounts, my research assistant, and I decided to team up and research um, the issue, and we we looked at over 250 U.S. seafood species and narrowed the list to about 85. They're in relatively good shape from an environmental perspective. They're not overfished or they're harvested using a gear that doesn't result in a lot of bycatch or they're farmed in an environmentally sound way. And we sent that list out to chefs all over the country and asked if they would contribute recipes that included one or more of the species from that good um, species list. And we ended up with over 150 recipes from over 100 top chefs throughout the country, including several um, right here from the Boston area. So the book is actually... Um, uh, a cookbook that's divided into about 20 sections based on the type of seafood that's in the recipe. So the first chapter is oysters, mussels, and clams, and then scallops. And then at the end of the recipe section, there's an entire chapter on uh, current environmental issues regarding U.S. seafood. So if you really want to learn what the issues are, um, you, you can you can use this book as a as that kind of resource. So it is a cookbook, but it's a marine conservation project in the form of a cookbook. And I think you'll find it has a very positive tone in part is, like I said, we focused on the positive. Nowhere in there do you find a list of do not eat seafood species. And also because we don't see this as a hopeless situation. Um, in the same way that you can um, impact um, uh, resource conservation through recycling, 
Individuals can have an impact on marine uh, conservation simply by diversifying your seafood choices over a broad range of well-managed uh, species. Um, so as uh, John mentioned earlier, the artist from the book, uh, Charlotte Knox, is joining us this evening. We're both going to be over there next door um, signing books. Um, Charlotte is from London, but uh, or I should say formally from London. Charlotte, uh, Charlotte and her husband, Joe, have, have recently moved to the Boston area. Joe has taken the job with the Fine Arts Museum in Boston. So um, we're really lucky to have uh, Charlotte here with us tonight. I think if you take a look at this book, you'll agree that it is doesn't look like your average cookbook. It is so beautifully illustrated. In fact, um, Senator Patrick Leahy wrote one of the blurbs on the back of the book, and he said that not many uh, cookbooks would look this good on a coffee table. So <laughs> we can uh, thank Charlotte for that. Okay, um, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. I think, and okay. um, I'll try and, and I'm going to encourage people to sort of shout loudly. We don't have a microphone to go around. Okay, I'll just repeat your question. Okay, right here. Okay, the question's about El Nino. She was, uh, um, the, the lady asking the question was also there in the summer of 98 and saw the devastation that El Nino um, had on the islands. And the question was, does it recover right off the bat or does it take many years? Because since I've been going back every year, I've been able to um, observe what's going on. Um, the short answer is that it really rebounds almost instantaneously. I mean, it's remarkable. Um, now, you do see some long-term effects, and one of the long-term effects apparently that um, they're monitoring right now is the size of the marine iguanas. The marine iguanas apparently are getting smaller over time because during these relatively frequent El Nino events, um, they're not, there's no algae, okay? So apparently the smaller ones are the only ones getting enough food during those periods to survive and pass on their genes. So it seems like the, over time that the, that the impacts that El Nino are having um, are, are showing up in, a, in an odd, odd way that you wouldn't expect. Um, but, uh, you know, these events are, are unpredictable, but they, they seem to be quite frequent, um, you know, in, the, uh, in that area and, and quite severe. But, um, but it, it, just, it just bounces back. It's remarkable. And that's what I was saying. I mean, to see, for me to see that seesaw, you know, from one extreme to another in about a six-month period just blew me away. Okay, the question is, when you bring um, creatures up from 3,000 feet, why isn't there a decompression uh, effect, or is there? Um, most deep water fish don't have swim bladders or gas bladders. They don't have any enclosed air sacs. Like we have lungs and shallow water fish have, have got gas bladders that they use to control their buoyancy. And it's air inside an enclosed sac that causes problems when you come up through um, the pressure changes because um, the air inside that, that sac expands. And I can tell you that this, of course, is the first time I've ever done this, but we had better luck bringing up fish from 3,000 feet that don't have a swim bladder than even something from 200 feet that does. The ones from 200 feet just literally blow up. I mean, the eyes come out, the, you know, the stomach comes out of the mouth. It's not a pretty sight. Um, the biggest thing facing these deep water organisms coming up is not the uh, pressure, it's the temperature change because they're living in, in quite cold waters down there. However, as I mentioned, the surface waters in Galapagos are quite cool. Um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium in, in California has, um, to my knowledge, the first exhibit of deep ocean life from the Monterey Bay Canyon right there, and I think we can learn maybe something from them about what you can and can't bring up and uh, you know how long you can keep it alive. They're, when they first opened that exhibit, their website said that they were focusing initially on the hardy specimens, which I took to mean ones that they could actually <laughs> you know, keep alive in the tank. I think one of the things you have to get over is you know, getting the animals comfortable enough to feed. And we, we needed everything to die in the end because we need the specimens. We kept everything alive in a shipboard aquarium for three or four days, but we didn't even try to take them beyond that point. Okay, I mentioned that um, 60,000 tourists uh, visit each year the Galapagos. Does that have any impact on the ecosystem? Certainly it does, but, um, but this is one case where I would argue that tourism is probably going to be what saves that place rather than the other way around. Um, Ecuador is a poor country, and they get a lot of revenue from tourism in Galapagos, and they, it was one of those places they caught early enough, okay? And they, um, so it's not, been, it's not been destroyed, and they know if they don't take care, continue to take care of it, they're going to lose that revenue. I think you'd be surprised, and, and um, 
pleased if you visited there just how well run the tourist operation actually is. Um, you, when you go from island to island, you have to be uh, uh, accompanied by a naturalist guide on the islands, and they keep you in line. You know, you have to stay on a path. Um, you can't take food or, you know, fruits or vegetables or anything on the island, so you're not spreading seeds. You, you clean your shoes when you arrive on the airplane there. So there's a lot of uh, strict rules that are... Um, um, in effect for the terrestrial part. I'm a bit more concerned about the marine realm in Galapagos, and it's really not so much from tourists as it is from the fishing, um, the, the c commercial fishing. Um, but the, in terms of tourism, there have been some oil spills in the Galapagos related to the tourism industry, small relative to some of these you know, major ones that we've, we've heard about, but still. Um, it's a huge area, you know, the marine realm is there, and even though they have a lot of... Uh, um, uh, rules in place in terms of, um, uh, you know, the fishing, for example, um, they don't have the manpower to police it. So I think some of the conservation groups in this country are trying to help them out by not just sending money over, you know, because you never know what happens to it, but by actually sending boats and radios and, and helicopters and things like that. But, um, but I, you know, considering that many tourists go a year, and uh, it's really, it's in great shape. Okay, the question is, there's not much light at 3,000 feet. There's none, in fact. Um, uh, <laughs> and what happens when you shine the light on the, the fish and then bring them up into the surface? Um, well, you know, we, first of all, it's, it's hard to make um, too many observations about behavior, you know, down there for that, for that purpose exactly. And that's, you know, when you shine a light on them um, from the submersible, you have no idea if they're acting anything like they normally would if you didn't have that light on them. Um, all I can say is that, you know, it, it doesn't kill them. It probably stresses them a bit when you bring them up into the surface uh, light. Um, the, the Monterey Bay Aquarium exhibit that I mentioned earlier um, noted in their website that they are filtering the, the light that these animals are exposed to to try to uh, better simulate their natural environment. Okay, what's the process, uh, process of determining whether a species is new to science or not? Um, there are two basic ways. One, you can use genetics. You can uh, use DNA, which is more common now than, it, of course, it ever was. Um, and there's just a, you know, a, a particular amount of genetic divergence that you look for in a particular group, and that will vary from group to group. Um, but uh, the other way is based on morphology, and what you need to do is compare um, any related taxa that occur in the same place and find out if you can separate them. It doesn't matter what it is. It might be the pattern of scales or a pigment pattern or the shape of the teeth or um, the number of vertebrae or fin rays. You never know. That's why we, you know, we, we examine these things in detail um, to, to look for uh, differences. Also, it's also helpful when you have a, a species that you know what the variation is from, um, you know, in a, in a given place. So, um, so there's, somebody said, I think, that the, the best way to uh, describe a new, or identify a new species is for an expert in the field to do it, <laughs> because you, t you, you sort of tend to get a feeling for um, how different uh, species in different groups vary and what kind of variation you're looking at to determine if it's a different species. Obviously, you know, speciation in itself is a process. You're looking at divergence, and that, you know, of course, what's happening in Galapagos is that these populations of organisms were isolated, main, most of them from the mainland, okay, and once they become isolated from the mainland, they start diverging if there's no reproduction between the, um, the Galapagos populations and the mainland. At some point, you know, you can, they've, they've diverged to the point that if they ever got back together again, they wouldn't be able to reproduce. That's when they're, they're separate species. Actually identifying that exact spot is, in, 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 in theory, difficult, and so um, we just do the best we can with, uh, with, with DNA and with morphological attributes. How long is the survival rate of the species that we captured? Do you mean in captivity? Um, well, again, we, we only kept them alive for three or four days because we need to preserve them to, to bring them back for study. But, again, the only, my only knowledge of um, the longevity of something like that is with the Monterey Bay Aquarium, and they're, act, they're actively doing it. They're keeping things alive for, for months at a time, if not longer. 
And let me just add, since that question came up a couple times, the reason we need the specimens is that if you don't have the specimen, you can't describe a new species, okay? So, for example, that octopus that we were trying to catch, that may well have been a new species. We'll never know. We can't name it. We can't describe it unless you have a specimen, a physical specimen that you attach to the new name that you give that species, and that specimen has to be deposited into a permanent uh, archival collections such as those we have at Smithsonian. Okay, thank you very much and hope to see you over next door.